much for listening to this lovely introduction and um, for having me here today. I feel really honored to be in front of such an accomplished and inspiring audience and as well to be speaking amidst other really impressive speakers that we have today. So my favorite part of today is certainly being able to be here and listening and engaging with all of you. Uh, so thank you. Um, I wanted to share a quick clip before I started just to provide some visual insight into what it is that is a part of what I do. So um, I guess we can cue up the clip and then I'll continue. In October 2011, 18-year-old Sasha DeJulian became the first American woman to scale the rock formation known as Pure Imagination in the Red River Gorge of Kentucky. Considered one of the most difficult climbs in our country, it took three days. What better backdrop for those powerful words from President Theodore Roosevelt that inspired the title for Brene Brown's book? It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. next Sunday. I'll see you in the arena. Uh, thank you. I figured I couldn't say it better than Oprah, so I let her take the lead. Um, many of you may be wondering, I'm not sure who in the audience out there climbs, but how it is that one becomes a professional climber. Um, certainly at six years old, I never envisioned myself to be a professional climber. And to be honest, I didn't know that professional climbing was even a sport. Um, in 1998, my brother had a birthday party at a local climbing gym. And I went to the birthday party. I was the only girl who was there uh, my brother was a hockey player, and it was me and his hockey team. And for some reason, I succeeded up the walls that we were given to climb uh, at the birthday party. And that inspired me in part because my brother and I, at 14 months apart, were unnaturally, probably unhealthily, very competitive with each other. And I was really excited to be doing something better than him. But <laughs> ego aside, I really loved climbing for the fact that it was me in control of myself. And if I wanted to be at the top of the wall, it was up to me to be at the top of the wall. Um, so I joined the junior team program, which was the local junior team program assigned for kids who are interested in becoming more a part of climbing and to partake with climbing as this form of a hobby, uh, which met Wednesdays and Saturday mornings. And I did that for about a year. 
And one Saturday morning, I walked into the gym, the climbing gym called Sport Rock, and they were holding this regional youth championship. And this was me literally stumbling upon this competitive realm of the sport. And the organizers allowed me to compete, even though I hadn't done any of the um, preceding competitions, which were local competitions that you go through in order to qualify for the regionals. And they told me, you just can't go on to the next round, which would be divisionals and then nationals. And then from youth nationals is when the youth junior team to compete internationally is chosen. And I was like, I don't care. I just want to climb today. Uh, I had no sort of perspective of what it was that I was doing on a competitive level. But I competed in the youth regional championship and I was eight years old at the time, and I won my category, which was 11 and under, uh, and I was kind of inspired, who doesn't like to win? Uh, and I started seeking out what it was that was the competitive realm of climbing, which is essentially a series of competitions that are held in indoor spaces, so indoor climbing gyms, and the winner is determined by who gets up the wall fastest, and also who gets up the wall to the highest point. So time is a tie is a tiebreaker, but we all compete on the same climb, and it's it's judged by a level of difficulty. And um, through the first decade of my career climbing, I'm 23 now, so I've been climbing for 17 years, which is kind of kind of strange to think about actually because I don't really remember life so well without climbing, being a significant part of it. Um, I was competing first at the local level and then for the junior team internationally in competitions by the age of 13. Um, but a lot of my time spent growing up was doing this balancing act of going to school and also pursuing a sport. And it was before I really established climbing as my profession. Um, I grew up in a family that really encouraged academics, and my parents encouraged me to excel in school, um, and it was always assumed that I was going to go to university. So I constantly was optimizing my time to try and focus on my priorities, which were at the time going to climbing practice, which was then about five days a week, and also going to school and um, traveling when I could. I, by my senior year in high school, I was competing for the US team and I was supported by enough endorsement deals for me to call it my profession. Um, but in order to compete internationally, I needed to miss class and it, I needed to prioritize what it was that I wanted to be doing apart from climbing and school, and in order to maximize my efficiency in order to make it happen. Um, but what has guided me to be able to set these decisions and to be able to isolate going to prom for the chance to be competing in the Pan American Championships in South America was always this drive to define my own path. and to challenge whatever it was that I was the most passionate about. And that was for me always climbing. And it's served as this steady stone in my life of building my self-confidence and my awareness of what it was and who it is that I want to be. Um, I started working with my first brand when I was 12. It was an endemic climbing sponsor called Mad Rock. And it was through a series of endorsement deals, starting with simple product-based deals to financing my trips in order to travel the world and to compete and climb outside to then negotiating deals that would support my life and my education was how I kind of made that transition to make climbing my profession. Um, perhaps my biggest breakthrough in my career as a climber was I was sitting in calculus class in 12th grade, and I received an email on my phone um, on silent, and it was uh, Adidas wanting to sponsor me. 
And that that was when I I can really recall being like, wow, I'm actually like gonna be a professional athlete. Um, so, anyways, after I finished my senior year at high school, I took some time off of school and I traveled internationally. I went to about 28 different countries to compete and to climb outside. My, my main initiative of that time off was to try and win the world championships. And um, I think one of the proudest moments that I've had in my career thus far was standing on the podium as the American flag raised and hearing the national anthem and being like, wow, that's for me, that's pretty neat. Um, but climbing, more importantly, has served as this passport to see the world and to see it in the most remote locations and to experience cultures uh, and regions and compositions that few Westerners in most cases have actually traveled to before. Um, but that said, I'm, I'm in the in New York City now by the week uh, going to university and then typically on weekends and on my school breaks, I'll be traveling for climbing. Um, and I think that identifying and dedicating, my, dedicating myself to my passion has served as this really powerful tool for me to learn about perseverance and determination, but also, what I want to talk about with you guys today is how to overcome fear. And first of all, I don't want to give the impression that climbers are completely fearless. Um, it would be, in my opinion, slightly psychopathic not to experience fear when you're thousands of feet up. And it's something human to be aware of risk. And the way that I deal with risk is by categorizing it into rational and irrational senses of fear and risk management. And I think that when fear is rational, a way that I confront it is to acknowledge the situation and assess how to move forward safest uh, and whether it's worth it. And then when fear is irrational, um, which is being afraid of falling when you're tied into a rope and you can trust your gear. That's when I think about fear and I think about not falling and falling becomes not really an option because if you fall, then it's kind of background noise and it's part of this attempt to reach the top, but you're secured by a rope. Um, and I think that if you think about falling when you're trying to optimally perform, you have, um, if you think about falling when you're trying to optimally perform, then you're already inhibiting that availability of your optimal performance and success will not necessarily be certain. Whereas if you can isolate out the background noise of being afraid to try something that you're not sure that you can do, then you can really focus on achieving that task. So I experienced a heightened sense of this. Uh, last June, I was climbing in Southern California with a friend, and he brought up an article he'd seen of Swiss alpinist Uli Steck and Stefan Segrist, who had recently pioneered a route up the north face of the Eiger. And it was rated one of the hardest routes up the biggest wall in the Swiss Alps. Um, it had also been never climbed by a woman. Uh, so... It seemed like a good challenge. I was pretty naive to the whole experience of what I was getting myself into, but irregardless, I thought, that sounds cool. Uh, so I texted my friend, who is another professional climber, Carlo Traversi, and I said, hey, do you want to climb the Eiger in Switzerland in August? And he was like, sure, why not? <laughs> um, and I, I think that that was like the, the stepping stone to what led to a really long experience in August of um, suffering through rain and ice storms and snow in our pursuit to climb this mountain. Uh, the north face of the Eiger is nicknamed the murder wall. Uh, over 60 climbers have died in their experience of attempting to cl free climb the north face. And um, the weather was certainly not in our favor for the entire trip either. 
our first week, I was quite unfamiliar of the extreme circumstances that the weather could have on the mountain. And there was an impending storm that was coming in, and we were in the process of climbing um, the route. And there were two other climbers on the wall at the time. And we had been told that we could not be on the mountain during a storm. And so we decided to not push our risk too much, and we left back down to town um, and abandoned our efforts that we had made already in pursuit of the summit. And the two other climbers that were parallel to us on a different route stayed on the mountain. And the next day, they were carried out by helicopter and body bags. Um, so I think that that was when the severity of the situation really hit us hard. And that was how do we go about this safely and how do we achieve a goal that we have while also assessing that we're safe and that we're not putting our lives in danger. And um, I think that this experience of climbing the Eiger was full of new experiences for me. First of all, I had never slept on the side of a mountain before. Uh, typically when I go on climbing trips, I'm staying in a hotel or renting a house. And my climbing partner and I had to dig a ledge on the side of the cliff in order to put our sleeping bags down on a s flat surface. And then we slept in our harnesses and tethered a rope to the side of the cliff so that if we did fall, then we're sleeping on a three foot wide ledge. So we didn't really wanna roll off the mountain. That would be a terrible way to wake up. Um, and in order to climb a mountain successfully, to free climb a mountain successfully, you have to climb it from the bottom to the top without falling. So every time that you fall, you have to restart at the bottom of the pitch, which is essentially the uh, mountain is made up of different pitches. And the Eiger is too long and too technical to accomplish in a single day. And that's why um, we did need to sleep overnight. And basically, you're bringing up with you all of your food, all of your clothing, and all of your gear to last you for however long you plan to stay on the climb. Um, and this is something that was completely new to me. And um, in order to eat, we would be making oatmeal in the morning with peanut butter. Uh, we made these rice cakes uh, for lunch as long as with bars. And the rice cakes were basically comprised of maple syrup, peanut butter, bacon, and uh, something else that was as calorically dense as possible because all of the food that you consume is essentially your fuel and you need as much energy in as light and densely compacted uh, sustenance as possible. And uh, then for dinner, we would generally rehydrate food with our boiled water from our little stove that we had with us. Um, but we have to be pulling up everything that we're um, climbing with. So you want to be as minimal as possible. I tend to overpack for about every trip. So this was a new experience as well. Um, and um, at times, really, our morale was really low. Uh, we experienced bad weather. And also for me, I experienced a lot of negativity about what it was that we were going after, both through other people's comments that I would hear about from media or people online. Um, I try not to read too much about online uh, forums or anything, but no one's really bulletproof and sometimes we do let that pervade through and we see that and comments like little girls don't belong on the Iger was something that was a constant theme of my trip. And I think this is because Alpine climbing is this industry that's dominated by men and few women have really done big pursuits outdoors in the larger mountains. So um, while I was kind of experiencing all these new uh, challenges while climbing itself, I was constantly questioning why it was that I was trying to do this thing that supposedly I didn't belong to be trying. Um, and then more relevant also was while we were climbing, there was a team of other male Swiss alpinists who would constantly be on the wall telling me that maybe I should go across the valley and try some sport climbs 
where the weather was better and I wouldn't get hurt and assessing how it was that I was using my gear. And I've been climbing for 17 years and I kind of was like, I know how to repel and I know how to belay. Um, but experiencing this negative feedback was something that I needed to mute out in order to focus on my own challenges, which were coming from the mountain. And um, that was something that was quite new for me to be experiencing. Um, and I honestly didn't really know if what we were trying to accomplish was something that we could do in the span of the time that we had allotted because I needed to return for class by the end of August, um, which was this other little looming factor. But on at the end of August, we had a weather window that lasted about four days, and we optimized all four days. We were climbing about eight to ten hours a day. We started from the bottom, and we made it to the top um, after three nights on the mountain. And it was this feeling of complete unparalleled sense of satisfaction that didn't actually set in till about a few weeks later probably because the following weeks I had these nightmares of waking up on the side of the cliff and not being done uh, and the day that we actually summited um, I couldn't open my hand because my forearms were so tired from the previous days but finding it in yourself to be able to accomplish something that you completely dedicate your mind and all of your strength towards trying to achieving was something that was a really pivotal moment in my career for me realizing that I don't know what I'm capable of achieving, but I don't want to listen to other people telling me that I can't do something. Um, I think that what what I'd like to do with my own career is to prove to other people and to inspire other women in particular to follow their own passions and whatever it is that they're motivated, whatever motivates you to go and try, then the best way that we can learn what it is that we're capable of is by taking that first step. And I think that Fear, in many cases, is inevitable, but it doesn't have to be inhibiting. Um, so with that, I will close with a little video of me just after the summit. Um, I definitely don't have the type of dress that I have today, so kind of gives that little paradox as well of um, life and the experiences that we go through. And... Um, yeah, enjoy. And personally, it was really accomplishing something that I had no idea that I could do. Realizing that you can do something if you just try. So, my words to all of you is to go out there and take your first step in whatever it is that inspires you. And um, I look forward to hearing everyone else's speeches today and speaking with you all at the coffee break. So thank you for having me. Scream now.